Okay, thanks for joining us, guys. I'm just going to move over here. We've got a bunch of people in the lobby. Um, I am out in Los Angeles in Culver City at the Veterinary Cancer Group. Um, I'm your host today, Christina Chan, and shortly we're going to be talking to Dr. Reed, who is our resident uh, board-certified veterinary nutritionist, and we're going to get lots of great tidbits, including how to select the best foods for your pet, um, how to look at food labels, and then I've got a special guest with me today. Uh, we're going to do a live body conditioning score so that you guys can see um, how the experts assess whether your pet is at optimal weight or not. Um, I'm just going to wait for just a minute or two um, just to see if uh, we're going to have a few more people pop on. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us. Again, my name is Christina Chan. Um, I'm your host for today. Um, we're going to be talking to Dr. Weath, our resident board certified veterinary nutritionist. And we are going to cover all kinds of good tidbits about um, how to pick the best foods for your pet, um, how to read pet food labels, and also we're going to do a live demo with a special guest today. Um, we're going to do a body conditioning score so you could see how um, the experts assess uh, what an optimal pet weight is for your pet. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go in and say hi to Dr. Wee. So I want to bring you guys in with me. Thanks for joining me. Um, also a note, if you um, have not used the app before, there is a chat feature at the bottom. Please do go ahead and type in any questions or comments um, because we will get to them at the end and we'd love to see what you guys are thinking. So here we go. Hi, Dr. Wee. Hi. Hi. We've got Hello. Ellie down here, who's my pet pug. She's going to be part of our broadcast later. <laughs> yeah, I might have to donate her. Um, so I'm going to set the camera down here. We're crooked, so bear with me. Oopsie. most important part of diet selection is to know, you know, kind of first step is know what kind of dog you have. How mm -hmm. active are they? Mm -hmm. Are they a small breed? Are they a large breed? Is it a breed that's prone to gaining weight? So mm -hmm. you may have to keep an eye on calorie intake and treat intake. Is it a high energy breed that needs lots of activity, lots of, lots of exercise? So we're basically trying to match the diet to the dog. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So definitely things like breed consideration, size. And yeah. Things like exactly. That. Exactly. exactly. Um, and then we are also going to look at labels um, because they can, I mean, you think that they may be obvious, but they can be a little bit too complex. Yeah, sometimes. they can be. And, and I brought a few examples, so okay. I don't know if this is the right time to, yeah, to bring them. So, we'll take so a look at them I, I kind of wanted to start. So I'm starting with something that's not a pet food label. So this is a cereal, okay. the person's food label. And so everyone's used to seeing labels on packages that are listed here. So the, 
human nutrition facts. So we have serving size, how many servings per container, calories, calories from fat, protein, carbohydrates, sodium, and we have an ingredient list at the bottom. So everything's in one place and it's fairly obvious. So it stands out on the label. When we get to pet food labels, there, I mean, there are rules and regulations for what can and can't go into a pet food and what can and can't be on a label, but there's a lot of real estate that gets covered by other things. So we have the product name, and again, I, I brought a number of examples, and these are not um, that I'm recommending them over another. They're just sure. an assortment of different foods. So we've got, you know, pictures on the front that say what kind of, in, who it's intended for. So adult dogs, light, so a dog that's prone to gaining weight small breeds, so these are going to be smaller size kibble for healthy adults. We have feeding guidelines on the side. On one side, on the opposite side, we have ingredients and nutrition information in different languages. Um, and on the back, we have some additional information that's more descriptive of the diet. But of all this panel, the kind of the two most important parts are hidden right here. So every pet food will have a nutrition label on it, and I'll grab another one just so we can see if there's one that's a little bit more obvious. So this label lists nutritional information ingredients mm -hmm. on one side, and then we have feeding guidelines on the other. Okay. So can we um, back up for just a second? Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find one. Okay. Here's, here's a feeding guideline that has amount to feed. I'm looking for my AFCO statement. There's a few things on the label. Uh -huh. so here, here we go. Here's one that has everything all together. So a few things on the label we want to look for. So most people immediately zoom in on the nutrition analysis. Mm -hmm. The problem with looking at the guaranteed analysis is this tells you as a percentage of this entire package, mm -hmm. how much of it comes from protein, fat, fiber, and moisture. Those mm -hmm. are the only four things that are required on the label. Okay. Um, everything else is added in for a marketing benefit. So they've, the company has highlighted what nutrients they think you may be concerned about as a pet mm -hmm. owner, and they've put them on there. So some companies will list, so cat foods will always list taurine, sure. because pet owners are clued in to taurine as being an important amino acid for cats. Okay. It's usually absent on dog food labels. Now, a lot of times we'll see omega-3 and omega-6 mm -hmm. levels, because people are worried about that for joint health or skin, coat, uh -huh. skin and coat health. Um, but this really doesn't tell you much about the food itself and, and comparing foods. Okay. Things we're looking at on the label, we want to find a calorie content. Sure. This is required by law. So okay. every pet food that's sold in the United States should have a calorie content. And it should be listed on a common amount. So KCALs, which are just the same as a calorie on our pet food, mm -hmm. or our human food labels. Um, KCAL per cup. Uh, and then it'll have a per kilogram basis. They have to have it listed both ways. Okay. And then we'll have an AFCO statement. So the Association of American Feed Control Officials mm -hmm. puts together a binder yeah. every year. So a book every year. This is the, the 2017 official publication. Mm -hmm. And this governs, or governs, doesn't really govern anything. It gives the recommendations for what should and shouldn't be in animal feeds. Okay. So that includes live an, livestock animals, large animals, as well as small animals. This, um, this group... Um, those rules and regulations get adopted by the individual states, sure. and that's what's applied to pet food labels. Okay. So what you'll see on the label is a nutrition adequacy statement. So it'll have whatever food you're feeding, whatever brand and type, mm -hmm. is formulated to meet the nutritional levels established by the AFCO Dog Food Nutritional Levels Profiles for Adult Maintenance, mm -hmm. or it'll say that it's gone through feeding trials okay. and meets the levels. So a couple of things we want to look for on that nutrition adequacy statement. We want to make sure that it's complete and balanced for the life stage you're feeding. Okay. So if it's an adult food, we want it to say adult food. If it's the, uh, this is a puppy food. Mm -hmm. If it's a puppy food, it's really tiny at the bottom, but we want okay. to make sure that it says for growth and gestation, lactation, and growth of, this one says large breed mm -hmm. or large size puppy. So we want to make sure that it's, appropriate for the life stage of food. Okay. So puppy food versus adult food. Mm -hmm. Then formulated versus feeding trial. Mm -hmm. The big difference is a company, every company starts with a recipe. Okay. They develop a recipe based on nutritional information of all the different ingredients. They put it together in a profile that matches, meets or exceeds this mm -hmm. AFCO, these AFCO recommendations, and then they make the food. 
companies that have formulated their diets, mm -hmm. it means that they've balanced it according to a computer program. Uh -huh. They've made the food and they've sold it. Okay. A company that's put their diets through feeding trials means they formulated the food, so it's balanced on paper, but then they've also fed it to a group of dogs mm -hmm. to show that everything is digestible, absorbed, those dogs are, are healthy and do well for a period of time. Okay. So feeding trials is just another, it's almost like a safety measure mm -hmm. that some companies will do not required by law yeah so you can formulate a diet and sell it and there's a lot of companies that make formulated diets that have a history of manufacturing pet foods for generations and generations mm -hmm. um, and so they know how to make it okay. they know what to do what to put into it so i'm not too concerned when i see formulated on the label uh -huh. but for smaller companies or newer companies um, it is something that I, I i would advise pet owners to look for mm -hmm. so is it a small company and it's formulated um what other safety steps are they taking to make sure that the foods are completely balanced the way they say they are? Okay, that makes sense. perfect. Can yeah. I um, just can we pick a label and then maybe we can yeah. backtrack to this? Um, here, let's pick this label because it has everything a little bit. I think it's a little bit easier to have everything in one place. So when you're looking for what's appropriate for your age breed, is it always going to be, I guess, under so ingredients, under here? Some of it is going to be. So this is adult food for one year plus. Sure. Balanced for adult maintenance. Uh -huh. The only label requirements are puppy or adult. Okay. So senior foods, there's no specific. Uh -huh. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, there's no there's no particular requirement for what uh -huh. constitutes a senior diet. Uh -huh. So a lot of it depends on the individual dog. Okay. So senior animals, as, if they're healthy adults, uh -huh. they can their metabolism can slow down, so they may be prone to gaining weight. So then you might want to grab a light calorie food okay if they're a senior dog who's having any kind of digestion issues uh -huh. so something that changes as some animals get older you may want to diet that's more digestible okay that makes sense um, sure. but the nutrient levels that are in that food are uh -huh. going to be consistent no matter what if it's adult maintenance it means the vitamin and mineral levels are going to be at the same standard no matter if it's a light food or a more digestible food. Okay. And then I had a question about, um, so here, if I can zoom in a bit, um, we've got guaranteed analysis. And I think you mentioned that those ingredients tend to be things that are marketed because um, pet owners know that they're important. So can, do we look for any in particular? Should we ignore no, them? I would say you can ignore them. Uh -huh. So, you know, so here's another one, another company that's just listed out the four requirements. So protein, fat, fiber, and moisture. Okay. Um, it has the feeding guidelines, so it's formulated to meet the nutritionally, nutritional needs for all life stages. That mm -hmm. means you can feed it to puppies as well as adults, so that would be another thing to look at. Um, but they don't give us any of the other details, uh -huh. but I can look at the ingredient list. So they give us omega-3s and omega-6s that are highlighted here, Sure. but I can look at this ingredient list and tell you that salmon is a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Okay. So even though they don't highlight it on the label, there's going to be some omega-3 fatty acid content mm -hmm. in this food. Same with eggs. They're using, when they say eggs, it means they're using whole eggs, so the mm -hmm. yolk is a great source of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. So even though they don't highlight it, mm -hmm. it has to meet the levels of omega-6 fatty acids required by AFCO, okay. or recommended by AFCO, I should say. Um, and I can see based on the ingredient list that it does have a good balance mm -hmm. of fatty acids and essential fatty acids. So mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily worried about not finding it on the label. <gasps> what would you like? Yeah. Somebody's hungry. Right? <laughs> so I would say I, I tend to not worry about those mm -hmm. and not, okay. you know, and even comparing a lot of times people look at, well, I want to know that an animal protein is my first ingredient and the uh -huh. crude protein is high. Uh -huh. The problem with that is if you're looking and you're comparing foods, so this crude protein says 25% of the minimum. So 25% of what's in this bag mm -hmm. is protein mm -hmm. versus this one, which is only 17%. Okay. But the moisture content, the water content in the food is 65% uh -huh. versus a maximum of 10. Okay. So I can look at these ingredients and I know that based on how much water is in here, if you uh -huh. were to take it, all the water out and put them and compare them on a dry matter basis, this would be a much higher protein diet than this one. Okay. So the label, you, you can only compare like okay. items, if that makes sense. So like apples to apples. Apples to apples, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to pay attention to when, you know, a lot of consumers, a lot of pet owners will look at the ingredient list and say, I want 
animal protein is my first ingredient. Mm -hmm. Problem is you start with deboned lamb, chicken meal, jerk, mm -hmm. great. Okay. But then we've got potatoes and lentils right after that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies, what they'll do um, is they'll use different, let's see, let's see our ingredients here. And again, these are all, these, all the, the foods I've grabbed, they're mm -hmm. good quality companies, they make good diets, dogs mm -hmm. do well on them. Um, but just highlighting differences. So here is another company, it lists chicken as the first ingredient, mm -hmm. but then the second ingredient is wheat, the third ingredient is poultry byproduct meal, mm -hmm. and then we have rice, corn, barley, okay. and then oats are on there too. So what some companies will do to, to basically address that pet owner mm -hmm. you know, desire to find a protein on as the first ingredient mm -hmm. is that instead of using um, one protein and one carbohydrate, sure. because ingredients are ordered by weight mm -hmm. as they're yeah. added in, they'll use lots of different types of carbohydrates so they can spread out the ingredients so that it pushes, as a proportion of the recipe, it pushes the animal protein higher on the list, if that makes sense. So again, not that these ingredients are bad, mm -hmm. but it can be misleading if you're only looking for a particular list of ingredients. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, so we're learning something today. Um, <laughs> like yeah. this one. <laughs> Ellie is checking out the food, guys. She's hungry. She's yes. ready to eat. She's like, it's smell it all. Yeah, she, she's hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, in addition to the regular pet foods that are all kind of packaged and have all the mm -hmm. regulations, there are a lot of sort of fresh, health, maybe human grade type mm -hmm. pet foods out on the market. Yeah. So, I wanted to kind of get your assessment on what did you think of those? How do people know in those? What are the best foods to pick for their pet? So a lot of it depends on, you know, again, going back to the individual dog. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the diets that are based on fresh food formulations, so this is actually one of them, this, this diet oh, here, okay. the Fresh Pet Vital, it's, uh -huh. it's basically pasteurized in, in you know, proteins. Mm -hmm. So it's chicken, chicken liver, beef, salmon, eggs, cranberry, spinach. Mm -hmm. They do use pea protein. Um, as a more concentrated powder, but again, mm -hmm. most of these are whole key ingredients, and it's a, and it's a moist, has to be refrigerated diet. So this kind yeah. of is one of those styles of diets. Um, but the thing to be careful of is whenever you're dealing with fresh food ingredients, mm -hmm. the the fat contents for the animal protein tends to be higher oh. because the fresh food ingredients they're using, even though a company may label it as human grade, mm -hmm. none of the ingredients that are used in pet foods are intended for the human food market. So it's not like the chicken breast is going to one dog food company mm -hmm. and then they're tossing out the rest of it. Yeah. It's the chicken breast and the leg and wing meat goes into the human food supply and then what's left over, which is the carcass, is typically what's called mechanically deboned. Mm -hmm. So it goes through basically a big bone picker. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think of it that way. <laughs> and bone removes yeah. bone picking machine that removes the bones and leaves the meat. But what's left, if anyone has bought a, a roast chicken from the store, mm -hmm. you know that what's left on there is the dark meat and it's a lot of the fat so if it's cooked all together you'll have or even if it's not cooked together you'll have fat that's percolated kind of through it yeah so those fresh food ingredients tend to be higher in protein but they also tend to be a lot higher in fat and so for some dogs that can be a problem um you know it seems to be our smaller breeds so not necessarily pugs but miniature schnauzers and Yorkshire terriers yeah. are prone to a condition called pancreatitis mm -hmm. which means that if they get too much fat in their diet they can get very sick so we have to be a little bit careful too with some of these diets. Um, the the term human grade yeah. is it's technically a misnomer because again none of the ingredients are truly human okay. grade according okay. to the USDA. Sure. Um, and so that's something that may be changing in the future as yeah. labels labels start to get a little bit you know the marketing aspects of pet food start to overstate mm -hmm. <laughs> their purposes. Sure. Um, there may be more regulations on pet food labels. Um, but the biggest difference is, is it a fresh food diet versus a extruded? So this is a kibble, it's called extruded, versus gone through a, a canning process or a retort process to make a canned food. Yeah, it doesn't smell as good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. yeah. So when you're looking at those diets, like there's places popping up all over, mm -hmm. like the city I see. Oh, especially here in Los Angeles, yeah. there's lots of little, little yeah. pet food boutiques. You can go yeah. and you can pick up your 
fresh pet food. Yeah. So, um, would you say those are not to things that I well, don't know, human brain people? So they yeah. they call themselves, and some of them may actually be buying and sourcing ingredients from the same places that grocery stores can source. I don't I don't know if that's true or not. They may be going to the store working with the same distributors. Um, but you know, the important thing to know about some of the fresh food diets is you want to look at who's making it. So for a healthy adult dog, there's a lot of flexibility in the diet, and you can get away with being an unbalanced diet for months to years. So you could feed a dog. I would not recommend this. You could feed a dog chicken and rice. Just yeah. that's it. And if it's an adult dog who's gone through their growth spurt, they're not reproductive and they're not don't have any chronic illnesses. They could look okay on chicken and rice for a year or so. Yeah. The problem is it doesn't have enough calcium. Mm -hmm. And so they'll start pulling calcium out of their bones to maintain their blood calcium levels. It doesn't have, depending on the type of chicken, it may not have enough essential fatty acids. And so the coat will start to look dull and dry after about three or four months. And they may start shedding a lot more. And most owners don't think of it because after three or four months, the seasons have changed. Okay. And so they think, oh, well, it's now it's winter time and I'm using my feeder more. And so it's yeah. drying them out. Um, or they don't think about you know, the fact that they're not getting enough iodine. Mm -hmm or selenium to maintain their thyroid hormone function. And so their dog's metabolism may slow down, they may start to gain weight more easily. Mm -hmm. So there's little things that can happen um, that just take a little bit longer. So a healthy dog, there's a lot of flexibility and you can get away with a lot. Okay. So fresh food diets, I would say, who's making the recipe, who's yeah. formulating it, and do they understand what they're doing and know what they're doing. Okay. So for pet owners that are feeding their dogs or cats mm -hmm. or whatever that diet, I guess what we look for is whether or not there are some changes in the dog's diet. Like you want some kind of a coat. You want yeah, and I would say like look that. and look for that label. You know, look for that label that says it's complete and balanced. And even if it's sold at a boutique store that's only sold, you know, in the LA basin, uh -huh. it still needs to have that ACRA statement on it. It still needs to meet label requirements. Uh -huh. And if it does not contain that ACRA statement, uh -huh. it needs to have something else on it. Yeah. So, like this is. So you got that. <laughs> This is a can um, that's sold with the other pet foods in there. If you can, I don't know if it's visible there, mm -hmm. um, but it says this diet is intended for intermittent or supplemental feeding only. Mm -hmm. So that means that they know that it's not complete and balanced. The ingredients are pumpkin, brown rice, bananas, carrots, peas, cranberries, and cinnamon. No mm -hmm. vitamins, minerals, no protein. Mm -hmm. So you want to be very careful that the food you're giving your dog to, in order for them to maintain health and wellness for years to come we want to make sure that it's giving them everything they need so look for that label that will either say complete and balanced or intermittent supplemental feeding only and we want supplemental feeding that's fine for treats fine for occasional but shouldn't be their mainstay diet um, so I think next we're going to do a body conditioning score on Ellie. Ellie. And we're going to find out if she's on the proper way or not. I thought she was. Maybe maybe she's not. not. <laughs> so, so I actually brought. We'll go, I'll have you go through this. So this is, um, I'll show it to the camera. So this yeah. is the Wasaba is the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And they have, this is from their nutrition toolkit website. Um, so this is a body condition chart. It's based on a one through nine scale. Five is considered ideal, so it's highlighted in the middle here. Mm -hmm. So this is a dog that would be considered perfectly proportioned. Mm -hmm. uh, as you go up on the scale, you increase in body weight. And mm -hmm. as you go down on the scale, you decrease okay. body weight. So this is really kind of our fat index. Uh -huh. Each point on the scale is about a 10 to 15% difference in body weight. Okay. So if I have a patient who is 9 out of 9, uh -huh. who is this little chubby dog here, okay. That means they're at least 40% over their ideal body weight. Okay, and that's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So yeah, we'll find out. Um, so ideal weight, um, and there's even little descriptions here. So an ideal weight dog, ribs palpable, so you can feel the ribs without excess fat covering. Uh -huh. You can waist observed behind ribs when viewed from the top. And as you can see, their waist physically narrows, uh, and abdomen tucked up when viewed from the side. So every animal, no matter size or shape or breed, okay. their chest should be physically wider and deeper uh -huh. than their waist. Okay. As you go up on the scale, you start to lose some of that. So an animal that's a seven out of nine mm -hmm. tends to be a, more of a tube shape. Okay. <laughs> so their waist and their 
their chests are about the same yeah. with the rounds. Uh -huh. And when you go to nine, oftentimes this is a dog whose waist is wider mm. than their chest. So, mm. Ellie. Okay. Kind of Ellie. All right. So, what we're going to do on Ellie is we're going to bring her back in there. Sure. And I'm going to have you do the body position. Oh, okay. So, I'm feeling okay. over the ribs. So how well can you feel ribs? And then from the side, uh -huh. you know, does she have a tuck up? Does her, is her chest deeper than her waist? And when you look at her from the top, does she okay. narrow down? So she narrows down. I have to admit there's a lot of stuff going on around the ribs. <laughs> so, and she's, she's a pug, so yeah. pugs they are broader chested. Yeah. Um, and they do have these very adorable little rolls yeah. that they get too. Uh -huh. But, She's not going to hold her up. She won't <laughs> down and roll over. Um, so where would you put her on the scale? Uh, okay, my best guess. So is it an in-between number? Or is it no, I mean, it's a five or yeah. a six. Okay. So you can, I would say she's a six. That's my best Yeah, guess. I would agree. Is it? Okay. I would agree. <laughs> I would agree she's a six. But she still has a weight. Yeah. <laughs> she still does narrow down at the weight. So we're going to, I don't know if you can stay. We're going to. Maybe she goes on the floor. We yeah, we can see better. Okay, so this is Ellie. So, oh no, she's like, her. She's, she's like, no, I'm not. Okay. So you can see, so her chest, it does, it is wider, but she does uh -huh. have a little bit more covering around her chest. About how much does she weigh right now? I haven't weighed her. I oh. think she's probably 19 She doesn't say, she doesn't say like 18, 19. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. she probably has a pound extra that she's uh -huh. carrying, and she's carrying uh -huh. a lot of it in her chest. A little bit in her waist, um, but not bad. Now the challenge with a little bit of extra weight, she's one, one. She's just over one. Just over yeah. one. So the problem with a little bit of extra weight is she's only one. Yeah. And if it continues to go uh, up as uh, she gets older, then you can run into problems, especially with pugs because they do have a lot of breathing problems. They have these shorter noses. Their tongues tend to be too long. <laughs> for Their tongue is very long if you've seen it come yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, being able to breathe is uh -huh. important for pugs and bulldogs yeah. and boxes and terriers. And if they have more weight around their chest, it just makes it harder for them to fan their lungs volume. And they can get fat deposits around their, around their, around their neck and throat. Sure. So we just want to make sure that she stays healthy as long as possible. One of the other things I brought, and this is also on that Wasava website is they do have a calorie chart. So I can show the calorie chart has weights on one side and then calories across the other. So we can also look at if she is, so this is weight in kilograms versus pounds. So if she is right here, if you say she's an eight kilogram dog or she's about 18 pounds, sure. her calories per day, per day need is about 400 calories a day. If she should be, if she's a, a 18 pound dog mm -hmm. and should be a 16 pound dog, it's only a 40 calorie difference. Okay. And conversely, if she's 20 pounds and she should be 18, it's only a 40 calorie difference no, in that direction. So it's not, not a huge yeah. amount. And so 40 calories a day, that's not much. I mean, some of these foods, if you look at the cal cups per, uh, calories per cup, this is 461 calories per cup in this small white food. So, I mean, she gets less than one cup of food a day yeah. as long as she's not eating any of the treats. And if she's getting other treats, then I usually take a little bit off their daily food ration so that we have about 10% to give us treats. Okay. So she may only need two thirds or three quarters of a cup of food and we need to keep an eye on treats. Sure. Um, so that's you know, something to look at you know, when you're evaluating another aspect of the diet to evaluate. If you have a dog who has very, um, a very low energy requirement, you may want a food that has maybe what is one of the light foods so you yeah. can feed them a little bit more, especially if they're constantly looking at you, like, mm -hmm. which Ellie does <laughs> quite a bit, yeah, all the time, all day long. <laughs> so you think it's okay to give the proper human foods as long as you kind of adjust the dog? Yes. Foods. Yeah. So I'm and I am a, I'm an advocate of variety. Sure. I think variety is good. Um, I like to. <laughs> I like to keep their you know for my dog and cat patients, I like to keep their palates flexible. Mm -hmm. So if they're a one-year-old who eats dry food, I want to make sure that they will eat a little bit of canned food too. Mm -hmm. So that if we need, if something changes and she gets, you know, a bladder stone or something mm -hmm. three or four years from now, we can put her on a canned food and we know she'll eat it. 
or if you decide I want to start home cooking for her and I want to, I want you, you know, Dr. Weave, I want you to develop a recipe for me. I can develop a recipe for you, and we know she's going to eat those foods. Nothing, Nothing toxic though. So no raisins, no grapes, no okay. onions, no garlic. Mm -hmm. Dogs love the smell of garlic. Yeah. People love the smell of garlic, yeah. but it can be very bad yeah. for dogs and cats. And no chocolate. Either. And no chocolate. Yeah. No chocolate. Yeah. And be very careful with treats because some of the um, <laughs> some candies, gums, and even mm -hmm. some peanut butters use xylitol in them, yeah. which is toxic for dogs. So you mm -hmm. want to just be careful about artificial sweeteners too. She says, Debbie, yes. Yeah. You're sweet enough, Mom. Yes. Aww. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so we have some questions. Um, if for those of you that, that have questions and haven't put it in the chat box yet, um, feel free to do that because we're going to get to them now. Um, so we want to know what your comments and questions are. I'm going to click over here and see. Okay. So um, Living Healthy says, why are there crazy foods like bison and boar included in dog foods and are they safe for dogs so bison and boar so the, i'm going to answer the second part of that question first so okay. yes they are safe for dogs okay. the reason that they're on there is because pet owners want to see them there uh -huh. so in a lot of the exotic meat ingredients started for animals with food allergies or food sensitivities mm. and there's nothing to prevent them from being used in pet foods sure. and so companies are trying to meet what they perceive as a demand okay. for exotic ingredients so a lot of owners will you know want to call it not necessarily a self-diagnosis but a, they'll diagnose their animal with an allergy okay um when it may not be an allergy but they'll grab the next exotic ingredient okay if that makes sense so that sure. the only problem with that is if owners are are trying to diagnose allergies in their pets without their veterinarian, they uh -huh. can end up exposing, if that animal does have an allergy, they mm -hmm. end up exposing them to a lot of different proteins. Mm -hmm. And then when we actually, when they come to me and we're trying to find something that truly is novel for them, mm -hmm. they've already eaten everything up under the sun. And so then we're left with hydrolyzed diets or having to really kind of use our food chemistry a little bit more. Okay. Um, sure. So yeah, so that's, there's, they're not harmful. Uh -huh. They're in there because pet owners want them more so than dogs. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So actually, I'm, I'm curious then, if you think your um, pet has a food allergy, so can you do it kind of the way that they do it with people, which is sort of eliminate stuff one at a time to find yeah, out what it is? Absolutely. And, and, owners, yeah. and that's something that owners, if they, they do it correctly, they can do it at home. So with food uh -huh. allergies, we do, you know, if they were to come to me and wanted to help diagnose a food allergy, uh -huh. there's there's only one way really to do that. And, that, and that's with an elimination and challenge trial. So okay. we take out, we remove everything they're getting by mouth. So mm -hmm. that includes chewable treats, mm -hmm. supplements, you know, any monthly, like you know, a lot of the preventatives will be flavored with beef or pork. So we have to keep out things like heart guard and next guard. Mm -hmm. We need to look at the ingredients on those too. And we take them all away. Okay. We find replacement when needed. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll feed them a diet that has completely novel ingredients okay. for eight to 12 weeks. Okay. And the owners have to be very strict and they have to you know, pay attention to what they're feeding. Yeah. The problem with using over-the-counter diets mm -hmm. for limited ingredients, so if you were to buy, I don't think I have any, um, I didn't grab any, even, well, even something like this, let's mm -hmm. call it a, a grain-free diet. So you have to look at the ingredients. So you need to know it's not just the animal protein that, that I'm worried about, it's the plant-based proteins too okay. that animals can have allergies to. Sure. The other thing to consider is that over-the-counter diets, there's no requirement to put an allergy statement on the label like there is for people. So mm -hmm. on a human food label, you can look at the ingredients and mm -hmm. it tells you exactly. You need to have a full ingredient and you have contains wheat, mm -hmm. manufactured in a facility that also processes milk, hazelnuts, almonds, and coconut. Sure. So if you have an almond or milk allergy, you're not eating this food, mm -hmm. even though it's not on the ingredient list. With pet foods, there's no requirement to do that. Mm -hmm. So this lamb, lentil, and sweet potato diet may be made right after the chicken and rice diet. Mm -hmm. And so it can pick up, there can be cross-contamination mm -hmm. of different ingredients. And that's just a normal manufacturing process. It's not that they're adding those ingredients to try to get away with anything. It's just sure. that's what happens when the, when the foods are made on shared equipment. So, so it's, allergy is better to work with your veterinarian from the beginning. Okay. Okay. But then they do need to be aware that it could be the foods, it could be the chew toys, it could be their flu it could, Exactly. I, yeah. And I had a client yeah. um, when I was in, I was in general practice before mm -hmm. I specialized in nutrition. And I had a client whose cat had very severe 
allergies. And the cat was scratching up mm. its head and, and it came to me with really like scabs all over its head and ears and a lot of, mm. a lot of fur loss. And she told me I had, you know, the other veterinarian that had worked at the practice before I joined mm -hmm. um, had put her on one of those limited ingredient diets. It didn't work. This mm -hmm. is just she must be allergic to something in her environment. So it's OK, let's step back and let's go through what your cat's getting. Uh -huh. And she had kept the cat on the same dental treats the whole time, oh, wow. the over the counter dental treats. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, let's let's go back to our food trial. Let's change uh -huh. the diet, but also stop giving those treats. I'm going to give you something else yeah. to use instead. And within three weeks, the cat had stopped itching. The fur was starting to grow back. And it was just, there was that treat she kept giving because no yeah. one told her not to. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's everything that goes in the mouth. Okay. Good to know. Uh, let's see. Um, also, another question is, is it okay to feed my dog cooked salmon or cooked tuna fish? Yes. Yes. Okay. In, in little, so I would say controlled amounts so that yeah. you don't give them too much mm -hmm. um, from, cal from a calorie standpoint. And also... Um, not so much with tuna, but with salmon, it's a pretty fatty fish, which is why it has a lot of good fats in it. Sure. But some dogs can't handle too much fat. So we don't want to have it. No one wants diarrhea. <laughs> no. Or to clean up diarrhea. Running a muck. So, house. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. depending on the size of dog. So, if it was um, an Ellie sized dog, mm -hmm. I would probably do no more than half of an ounce. Mm -hmm. If it was a bigger dog, you'd probably yeah. get away with two or three ounces oh, as a day. A, a, yeah, as a day. As a, yeah, yeah, so it's not much, but. Yeah. Because uh, you don't want them to get too much, but a half an ounce of salmon for her is about ten percent of her calorie intake. <laughs> so that's plenty. Yeah, there's a reason why you're sick. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. How about things like hard-boiled eggs, peanut butter, apples? Yeah. So again, you know, peanut butter just as long as it doesn't have xylitol in it, mm -hmm. and as long as we keep an eye on calories. Mm -hmm. So apples are great, especially fresh apples. Mm -hmm. um, they're crunchy. Dogs like the chew, and they're sweet. Mm -hmm. Dogs like the same things we do. They like mm -hmm. sweet. Salty, fatty, meaty. Mm -hmm. So all of those ingredients are going to be a hit yeah. for most dogs as well. Yeah. Um, just keep an eye on the calories. Mm -hmm. It's the big, the big one. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, are there any fruits um, we should avoid for our pets? Uh, so fruits, the only ones that you absolutely avoid for dog, for every dog mm -hmm. are grapes and raisins. Yeah. So grapes and raisins are toxic to kidneys. Mm -hmm. It's not every single dog. And I and I've talked to clients who said, you know, my dog, my dog growing up got grapes all the time, and it was uh -huh. not a problem. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> we know there is enough dogs that get very sick from grapes yeah. and raisins that I avoid it for everybody. Um, so those are the ones to really avoid. After that, it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. So if I have a patient who has a history of a, a bladder stone called calcium oxalate, okay. so calcium oxalate bladder stones are the most common type of kidney stone that people get. So okay. people get calcium oxalates. Um, so a lot of the same food restrictions apply to them. Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid any foods that have higher oxalate mm -hmm. contents. But other okay. than that, things like watermelon, apples were mentioned, bananas, uh -huh. blueberries, those are all fine. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so would you recommend uh, dry over canned dog food? Not necessarily. So it depends on the dog. So, you know, get back to the bladder stone example. So if I have a dog who has a history of bladder stones or mm -hmm. are urinary crystals, mm -hmm. I want to make sure they're getting lots of water. We want to okay. you know, flush them out on a regular basis. Yeah. The easiest way to do that is with canned food. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned dry food is only 10% protein, uh -huh. no, 10% water uh, versus something like a canned food. Now this is a stew, stew recipe, so it's a chunk in okay. gravy. And if you look at the water content, it's uh -huh. 82%. Okay. So it's easy, easier to get water in to a dog if we're feeding a canned food. They'll, sure. They're gonna drink more water and they're gonna get more water from their food. But other than that, um, you know, if it's a healthy dog and I don't have any concerns, mm -hmm. I think it's whatever works best for that owner mm -hmm. and that individual dog. Okay. Some dogs like the crunch yeah. of kibble. Yeah. It doesn't do anything for the teeth. So if they're doing dry food because they think it's gonna be good for their teeth, it mm -hmm. doesn't do anything for okay. that. Unless it's a specific um, diet they've gotten from their veterinarian that's a larger kibble size that they have to really chew on. Mm -hmm. um, so then it just comes down to what works for that family. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference between canned and dry food, other than the water content, is the fat content. Okay. So canned foods tend to use fattier cuts of meat, and they tend to use less um, carbohydrate and starch-based ingredients, mm -hmm. so the fat content goes up. Okay. So as long as we don't have an issue where the dog gets diarrhea if they get too much fat, mm -hmm. or they have a history of pancreatitis or high mm -hmm. blood fat levels, I'm not worried. And if you're trying to taper the weight of your dog down, canned foods are not the best. Well, actually, yeah. canned foods work pretty well because cans are portion controlled. You can't ah. feed too much of a can. Okay. You know exactly 
So if you grab this label and it tells you how many calories, so this can right here is 322 calories per can. Okay. You can't overfeed versus a, a dry kibble where you may, you know, is it when if you feed a cup, mm -hmm. is it a heaped cup? Yeah. Is it a level cut? Yeah. <laughs> is it a little bit less? Gray area um, there. <laughs> each kibble can add. You know, some sure. of these small bites kibbles are about five calories each. Mm -hmm. So if you add, if you're weighing out and measuring, or measuring out dry food, it's easy to overfeed. So canned food is actually, when I do weight loss cases, especially for cats, mm -hmm. I love canned food because you can't feed too much of it. You, have to, you have to physically open another can mm -hmm. in order to feed them too much. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Um, so. Living Healthy has an 80 pound American Bulldog who runs two to four miles a day. Good for your dog. That's more than yes. I do. <laughs> um, strong as an ox. Okay. And um, Living Healthy says thank you for your time. It's great. I um, want to see if there's last minute. Any other questions anybody wants to ask? Um, I'll just wait for a moment and see if there's anything that I missed. Um, if not, um, did you want to announce anything? No, I mean, I guess the only, the only thing I would add in uh -huh. is, um, so again, my, my name is Dr. Lisa Week. I'm a veterinary mm -hmm. nutritionist. I have, um, oh, Ellie. You're, you're so I do have a, a, a referral <laughs> as well as a client-based sure. appointment. So I'm here, I'm actually based out of the um, veterinary cancer group here at the City of Angels in Culver mm -hmm. City. And I see appointments on Friday. So if anyone wanted to bring their, their dog in, you don't need a referral to come see me in person. Um, if you're not, if, if I have a client or a patient who can't physically make it here, then we do, um, I work through veterinarians as well. So I, okay. I work with veterinarians in Texas and Florida and New York, so all over the country. Okay. And so you're able to teleconference. So I can. I usually don't, I don't teleconference with the owners. Okay. Um, and a lot of that comes down to just veterinary practice requirements. So I need to have a patient client doctor relationship. So you and I sure. uh, come here and I see Ellie in person, I examine her, I know exactly what's going on with her um, versus you telling me over the phone, it may not get translated the same way, or I may misunderstand the situation. So it's always better for me to see the animal in person, the patient in person. And if I can't do that, then we involve the local veterinarian who has examined the patient. So, yeah. Okay, I think that covers it for today. Thank you, everybody who is um, here joining us yes. on this broadcast. Dr. Leaf, everybody. Um, Thank you, Sue. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Yes, I'm very glad to have had you here. Um, next week, we're going to talk to Jessica May Tang. We're going to do ergonomics, easy ergonomics in the workstation. That's going to be on March 23rd, 1030 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So please join us for that if you are available. Um, in the meantime, thank you, everybody who has um, joined us for the broadcast. And please do leave a review if you enjoyed it. Um, see you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.